<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have two speakers today, uh, both of them are from Durham. Uh, Edith Edelman is a garden designer and is probably best known for the original design of the 300 foot long perennial border here at the Rawson Arboretum. Uh, that border has become sort of a benchmark for perennial border design in the United States in the latter part of the 20th century. And that border has received both national and international acclaim, has been written up in uh, many magazines as well as the Wall Street Journal and the New York <coughs> Times uh, by Alan Lacey. Uh, Doug Ruin, our other speaker, joined Edith later in, to help her with uh, volunteers to maintain that border, and they've done so for the past 35 years or so. Edith's many designs include a garden for the Durham Arts Council, for the Paul Siner Garden, uh, the Greensboro Arboretum, the Callaway Gardens, also Brookside Gardens in Maryland, and uh, both Edith and Doug co-designed the perennial board at the Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Charlotte. Uh, Doug Rubin is currently the gardens manager here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. He has worked at Chatwood and Montrose Gardens in Hillsboro, uh, the Daniel Stowe Botanical Gardens, and also the American Community Society headquarters uh, garden in Georgia. Both Edith and Doug are restoring the Elizabeth Lawrence border here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. And they have worked with the staff at the Elizabeth Lawrence House and Garden in Charlotte in preserving Elizabeth Lawrence's plants collection there. In many ways, both Edith and Doug are acolytes of Southern Garden writer Elizabeth Lawrence. And they're here today to tell us why Elizabeth Lawrence is still important today if you're going to be gardening in the Southeast. Please welcome Edith and Doug. Good morning. Um, I'm going to first of all thank the North American Rock Garden Society, the Piedmont chapter, for funding one of our internships here at the Walston Arboretum. Um, Tim and I are the only full-time employees here working in the garden. We do have one other position um, hired by Denny Werner as to help him with his red butt breeding, and she's 20 hours a week and. If Denny doesn't need all 20 hours, we get the rest of it, which is a big help. But um, thanks were due for funding an internship because that in the summer we have four additional people working in the garden, which is huge. Of course, I, I also have to acknowledge all the volunteers who do an awful lot of work in the garden and elsewise here at the Arboretum. Um, you have your... I, I think I'm on. Okay. Okay, just wave your hands frantically. Yeah. Um, this is the photograph that accompanied Elizabeth Lawrence's first garden column in Charlotte Observer in 1957. And she wrote, this is the gate to my garden. I invite you to enter in, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, um, so she wrote, she wrote it better than I'm going to speak it. Um, but not only into my own garden, but into the world of gardens. It's a world as old as the history of humankind, um, as new as the latest discovery of science. Um, but she said, um, I do not need to tell you, if you're a gardener, that your garden will demand every ounce of strength you have. Um, but I also do not need to tell you that it will be the most rewarding thing in your life. <laughs> um, there is a biography about Elizabeth Lawrence. Um, when it first came out, I attempted to read it several times and um, just I just couldn't get into it. I felt like the author of the biography is revealing things about Elizabeth Lawrence's personal life that I didn't need to know. I think when somebody's life work um, is out in the public, it doesn't mean that we have a right or even need to know about their own personal life. Um, so I've never gotten past maybe the first chapter or two. Um, I recently shared this thought with several of uh, people I know who are very much involved with the Elizabeth Lawrence Garden in Charlotte. And um, 
they, I was surprised. I thought I was the exception. They, they expressed similar sentiments. And I never wanted to read it <laughs> um, because I felt that Elizabeth revealed to us the things that she wanted us to know in her writing. And I think we're going to transition to her own autobiography. Yeah, um, having said that we never um, read her the, the biography of Elizabeth Lawrence, we are now going to read to you in its entirety her own biography. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I am 100%, uh, I, we will it, truthfully read you the entire biography, but it was merely a page and a half. It's something that appears in, I always get the title. Her, her, well, it first appeared in Herbertia. Yeah, yeah, she wrote it for Herbertia, okay. that part I um, remember. Well, which book? It, it's in the book, well, that Bobby Ward and yeah. Barbara Scott edited. And the titles of these books always... Um, a Garden of One's Own. A Garden of One's Own, yes. And we'll cover that book later on. Um, I'm, oh, no, wait, no, this is something, a poem that I've known forever that sort of is, I thought, reflected on um, what we just said about the biography and how Elizabeth Lawrence might have felt about it. Um, this is her, in her own words, when I was a little girl, my mother took great pains um, to interest me in learning to know the birds and wildflowers and in planting a garden. I thought that Roots and bulbs and seeds were as wonderful as flowers, and the Latin names and seed packages as full of enchantment as the counting out rhymes that children chant in spring. I remember the first time I planted seeds. My mother asked me if I knew the parable of the sower. I said I did not, and she took me into the house and read it to me. Once the relation between poetry and the soul is established in the mind. All growing things are endowed with more than material beauty. And we will occasionally interject our own thoughts into this. When you read Elizabeth Lawrence, you don't just read about you know, a particular plant. You read about how it was featured in Greek mythology or in the church calendar or something. So you see, you know, at a very, very young age, she's already um, establishing, you know, placing plants in, in a much broader picture than just this is a plant and it needs sun and moist soil. The move to Raleigh. When I was 12, we came to live in Raleigh in a house with an already established garden. She was 12 and that was in 1916. And and, are, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, and you see here some of the remnants of the garden, which none of this exists anymore, but, um, when we, when, well, I will say M.K. Ram and Larry, um, Larry Hatch were um, taking, taking a walk around Park Avenue, they noticed these crocuses in the ground. And that's how we came to find, because we visited Elizabeth and asked her about the garden. And she said, well, it was on Park Avenue or Park Street. But she didn't remember the number anymore. But they found it. and. Um, the members of the farmhouse fraternity were generous enough to allow us to go and dig some things from this garden. Um, one thing that was of interest to me, uh, and we're sorry, we couldn't figure out how to rotate this. So you see the summer house in the lower uh, left-hand corner, and that was still there, and it had um, bicycles strapped to it. But she writes about when they first came there that there was a kibia quinata growing on it. And we thought that was a brand new hot plant when JC <laughs> grew it at the Arboretum. Um, so that was, that was a very interesting thing to me about how much she found that was still there, how many plants of interest there were still in that garden. It was fall when we came, and there was not much in bloom, only some old-fashioned roses and chrysanthemums that the frost had not caught had not caught. Um, but the first spring was like living my favorite book, Secret Garden. Every day, the leaves and flowers, buds of some plant that we did not know was there would break through the cold earth. And 
a really interesting thing about the this novel, The Secret Garden. It was one book that J.C. mentioned as being what uh, turned him to a lifetime of um, you know, growing and uh, working with plants. There were snowdrops under the hedge. And, and, you go ahead. and crocuses in the grass. And yeah. that's and that's them <laughs> in the in the garden. And the garden pattern was picked out in daffodils and under the eaves of the summer house a single fat white hyacinth bloomed. No other spring has ever been so beautiful except the spring of the year I came home from college. That first year that first spring in the South after four years in New York led me to choose gardening as a profession. So in, in a very few sentences you see how she um, you know, came to uh, the lifetime pursuit that she followed the rest of her life. In the fall, a course in landscape architecture, the first in the South, was started at the North Carolina State College which of course is NCSU nowadays, and I started with it, uh, the only girl in the class. One morning, a visitor came into the drafting room and stopped at my drawing table in, a pass in passing and said, I know another Miss Lawrence who is a landscape architect. She knows as much about plant material as anyone in the profession. I felt as if the mantle of the other Miss Lawrence had been thrown across my shoulders. I had never heard of her before and never <laughs> heard of her since. But because of her, I felt a compulsion to study plants. I soon learned, however, that a knowledge of plant material for the South cannot be got in the library, most of the literature of horticulture being for a different climate and that I would have to grow the plants in my garden and learn about them for myself. <coughs> so when, when you read Elizabeth Lawrence, you are reading about her own experience. You're, she is not an armchair gardener. Um, sometimes she's writing about other people's experience with plants, but she is talking about you know actually growing the plants she's talking about. My ancestors were people who lived to be very old. And it encourages me to know that I may have inherited their longevity and that I have many years ahead to see bloom in garden flowers that I have never seen in bloom before and have only just heard of. So that is her entire autobiography. You lived through it. Um, thank you for not bolting from the room when we told you we were going to read the whole thing. Um, Dear Mr. Couch. Um, right. I've written a garden book for the Middle South based on my own records, which I have been keeping for a number of years with a book in my mind, where there is no book for gardens, gardeners in our section, and there is need of one. This is the letter that she wrote to uh, Mr. Couch, who was the editor at UNC Press. Uh, prior to the, um, his approving the uh, publishing of her first book, A Southern Garden, which has yeah. seen many reprints. It has, um, indeed. And, um, you know, I've read A Southern Garden many times, but um, in preparing for this presentation, um, I happened to just look through the table of contents, and it really makes clear that what A Southern Garden is, is a book about creating, um, you know, beautiful garden displays in, in your own gardens over the course of the year. It follows through the um, um, you know 12 months of the year. She starts with winter, which is I think an interesting thing, and ends um, at the end of the year. And um, it's it's all about you know the the plants for each season and you know the the and the whole range of plants. She she was not the least bit of a plant snob. She grew you know annuals and perennials and bulbs and woody plants and um, another interesting about um, a southern garden is she starts and ends by talking about broadleaf evergreens 
my first love has always been herbaceous perennials, but uh, she was a real generalist, and I always forget the fact that um, you know she probably valued broadleaf evergreens more than any plant. Um, uh, we will highlight a few plants as we go through this presentation, but this is not a presentation about the plants, but rather the plants are give us the opportunity to highlight how she described things because not only is her writing a wealth of information, it's also um, you know just a delightful thing to read. Yeah, um, this is actual this is actually a photograph that I took, rare and unusual, um, in Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Charlotte of uh, the Erythrina Christigalli. And this quote reflects um, a conversation with um, someone who was visiting her garden and was very surprised to see it in bloom, uh, what he perceived as so late, because he was from a warmer climate where it grew to be a tree and bloomed much earlier. But quite, quite a magnificent thing, and it literally grabs your attention, if not with the color of the flowers with its thorns. Even in the evergreen south, I like to see some trees and shrubs that are bare in the winter. Silvery cherries, satiny choke berries, dove gray magnolias, and most of all, very old crepe mur myrtles that look as if they are carved out of ivy, ivory. That's from gardens that's in that's winter. winter. Yeah, and that's a, a, a thing that I think she just describes so beautifully, the, the colors of the bark, and it's, it's very evocative. You know, even if we didn't have this photograph, I think you could somewhat see that just in her words, and that's another very special thing about the way she writes. Yeah, it is. this is her it garden is. in Charlotte, and if you that's, were there today, it would look much like that today. That's right. So that's the pool and uh, the wall at the back with the clock of the Madonna. Um, with silver bells, swan's necks, one must plant early single blue hyacinths. The hyacinths and pale daffodils are a cool blue and silver that reminds one of things past. Um, and these are plants, I sought out the, the swan's neck daffodils because of Elizabeth Lawrence. I had the hyacinths from my grandmother's garden and was able to recreate in part. Elizabeth Lawrence underplanted this with Vinca minor. Um, and I chose not to do that, having had some experience with Vinca minor. Um, <laughs> Um, you want me to read it? Yeah, that's yeah. I remember reading in The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson, Hodgson Burnett how that strange child, Mary Lennox, pushed open the gate to the secret garden and found sharp, pale points sticking up in the neglected flower beds and whispered to herself, they are tiny growing things and they might be crocuses or snowdrops or daffodils. Later, she said to the housemaid, do bulbs live a long time? Would they live years and years if no one helped them? And the little maid replied, they're things that help themselves. That's why poor folk can afford to have them. If you don't trouble them, most of them will work away underground for a lifetime and spread out and have little ones. <laughs> and certainly Elizabeth Lawrence's um, old garden here in, in Raleigh was a grand example of this. There was such a wealth of bulbs in that garden. Um. I, I love bulbs, and I love the little winter farm bulbs, so it was, it was just wonderful to find a book that was about growing them. There are a number of books on bulbs that are more just um, encyclopedias that don't really tell you all, about, all that much about growing them, certainly not growing them in this area. One thing that surprised me in this book is how um, there's some things she had access to that are hard to find nowadays, and, but at the same time, there's a wide range of things that are, were common back then that are still common, and a large number of things that, um, you know, like the 
genus Crocus is, is really large, but there's only a few that are a relatively few that are available uh, readily in the, uh, you know, in the through mail order nurseries. So there are some uh, specialty nurseries where you can get quite a few others. Um, Oxalis resilience. This is something that I saw in what I think of as the rockery area of Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Charlotte. Um, and something I brought back and we planted in the original Elizabeth Lawrence border. Um, she wrote, it's a winter grower. Those planted in fall produce foliage at once, bright green tree foils, as round as pennies with a purple sheen on the underside. The flowers usually come early in April and continue for more than two months. They are large for a wood soil, sorrel and most intent, and a most of a intense color called cyclamen purple. And I just, I just love her descriptions because even without that picture, I could see that ball. Her color terms largely came from a, a color chart. Um, she always referred to as the Ridgeway color chart. I think it had a, a, a different proper name, but um, I would give almost anything to have um, a copy of the Ridgeway color chart so I, I could look to it and it should describe something as cyclone purple, see exactly what that pigment um, is. Um, nowadays, when people use need a standardized color chart, they generally use the RHS color chart, which doesn't have descriptive names like cyclone purple or um, other terms. But you know, they have purple violet. Uh, you know, 72B or 72C, and so you know you don't really transmit that much information onto someone else with just 72B unless you have the chart right, chart right in front of you. But if you didn't know what cyclamen purple might be, you, you're not all that much more informed. Ranunculus um, carrier. The lesser celandine has been singled out by both Mr. Krippendorf and Mr. Wordsworth for its early brightness. It's best to keep it out of the rock garden and away from small and rare bulbs, restricting it to areas where an indestructible ground cover <laughs> is in demand. And this was another thing, um, the, the regular golden yellow one is another thing that we did find scattered among those crocuses over on Park Avenue. Um, that pale form actually came into Elizabeth Lawrence's Charlotte Garden from Pamela Harper. Um, so again, that wonderful sort of exchange of love of plants, information about plants, and the sharing of plants. Is that bright yellow one invasive? It tends to be, um, Doug might be able to speak a little more to yeah. this question. Yeah. Um, there are three, um, subspecies of Rhinunculus ficaria, um, which now nowadays goes by the name of Ficaria verna, verna meaning spring. Um, the common one, the, the bright gold one, makes adventitious plant bulbs or something like that on the plant and it spreads quite quickly. Um, most of the cultivars are of a different subspecies, and I no, no longer remember what the three spe subspecies are, and, and they don't make the adventitious bulbs on the plant, so they don't tend to spread around. Um, and then the third uh, subspecies is a giant one, which um, probably sounds scary, you know, but it's not an invasive one either. So I wouldn't accept, um, you know, the donation from um, somebody of just the little single gold one, but. Um, the named ones like Flora Plana or Brazen Hussey or, um, you know, there's so many of them nowadays. Um, they're well behaved in gardens generally. Um, there is a fun story about Brazen Hussey and J.C. Ralston. I got a postcard from him from England saying he found that uh, there's a, a Cicerinchium, a blue eyed grass cultivar called. Um, Lord, the name just slipped out of my brain. Quaint and queer. Yeah, quaint and queer. And JC said, I, I found the perfect companion to quaint and queer, a, a ranunculus called Brazen Hussy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I ever go through all my boxes and stuff, I think I can find that postcard from him. <laughs> and, and I will tell you that when JC came back from that trip to England, he presented me with a plant of Brazen Hussy, and I quietly walked him to the border and said, 
thank you. Because <laughs> it was already there. But we were very happy to have the Ciceration Quaint Queer. It's a very nice plant. Crocus labigatus is a little one that we have in the arboretum here. Um, and this is um, Elizabeth Lawrence talking to Bill Neal. Um, one January, she, uh, she discovered the delicious fragrance of Crocus labigatus fontanei. Remarking later, I did not know this for a long time, as you must get on your knees on the cold ground in order to find out. But it's a tiny little thing in bloom usually by late December, continuing into uh, January, and it is delightfully fragrant. Um, Sternbergia Olivia, the only species much known in gardens, has been called winter daffodil, fall crocus, and yellow amaryllis, but still has not a widely popular name. It is one of the many flowers identified as the biblical lily of the fields, and it may well have surpassed Solomon in all of his glory, for the radiant flowers are pure gold. Again, you know, her ability to describe a plant in just a single paragraph, but to give you so much information um, about that plant is quite wonderful. And I'm going to tell you, this photograph is in Suzanne Edney, Suzanne Edney's old garden um, in Cary. And I love the combination she has with the calicarpa, with the, the red violet and the gold. Um, I think Elizabeth Lawrence's descriptions of plants are, really inspire one to go out and acquire the plant and grow them. Right. Uh, this is, I had to put this in. This is Tom, who some of you will remember, a wonderful um, cat who lived at the Arboretum and loved to go on tour. He always followed every tour, and if you were the last person in the tour, Tom would speak to you quietly, which was an indication that it was time to pick him up. <laughs> um, but that's him in the garden with crocus ardshink and I thought, oh look at that echo of the white, the white bib, the white on the nose, and the white flower. Um, I'm sure it's a composition that Elizabeth Lawrence would have approved of. The um, Rhodophiala advena, when you leave Elizabeth Lawrence, it seems like every time she uh, wrote about this plant, it had a different scientific name. I noticed in your forward to the uh, 50th anniversary version of uh, Southern Garden, you wrote that it's now finally back to where it started as uh, Amaryllis advena. Well, no, well, uh, that was true <laughs> for that day, but the, the name du jour um, is once again Rhodophiala advena. And you've, if you've been in the Arboretum, of what about September or so? You've seen big masses of it here and, and there in the garden. It's a happy little bulb that does really well. Right. Now, this is a sort of an example of Elizabeth Lawrence giving us design and plant combination keys because she said that the dark <coughs> color of oxblood lily shows to best advantage against small white flowers. And in her garden in Raleigh, she planted it with the plant that was then known as Astromia mongolica. Uh, now, Calamaris? I don't maybe. remember. Anyway, we're not sure, but we know what we mean. It's the uh, Oxford uh, Orphanage. Thing yes. Exactly. And then she had a white, lacy, verbena tenuosecta. And she noted that she had to be sure to cut those back about a month before the oxblood lilies would bloom so that the flowers would be nice and fresh and combined with it. Yeah, so, so she wasn't just writing about the plants, but how best to use and display them in the garden. Okay. Oh, can I read this? Yeah. yeah. Um, Lacogum it's called St. Agnes' flower in honor of the patron saint of young virgins. The modest chaste and solitary bells are wonderfully fragrant, but the fragrance is not a violet, it is vanilla and something else, something that eludes analysis. Mm -hmm. This is a photograph that I took while lying on my stomach in Elizabeth Lawrence's garden when Lindy Wilson was in charge, was owned the garden. Um, and I was so excited because this is a plant I'd read about in Elizabeth Lawrence. I wanted to acquire it. I couldn't find it anywhere, and I finally got to see it. Well, then a little further research into her um, 
writings about this. She wrote that when she lived in Charlotte, when she, or when she left Raleigh for Charlotte, that her clumps of this were blooming very, very well and doing very well. And I'm going, I can't imagine a clump of it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, what she said just prior to that was she said, everything that's in the tray, even if it says it's Lacogum burnum, is actually Lacogum festivum. Festivum. Um, but, and I concluded that the only way to actually acquire Lacogum burnum is to be a friend of Mr. Crippendorf's. <laughs> And you know, the, the, the kind of description on the screen is not the kind of description you get in an encyclopedia of, of plants. And I don't mean to say that the, anything bad about encyclopedias, they're of great value. But um, you know, if you're a gardener, this is really one gardener to, uh, talking to another. Um, and the name on this Narcissus, I couldn't verify. I think she's probably. I think that's probably an out-of-date name for Narcissus. Um, oh, John Quilla. John Quilla. Um, they both, you know, any any of you that know me know that I I, I really enjoy knowing the derivation of words. Um, and John John Cifola and John Quilla are both referring to Juncus, the the common rush, which has a very narrow leaf, um, but. She writes that I think that the that next to um, Narcissus juncifolius, it it is the most adorable little bulb that I know. I'm sorry, I have trouble reading oh, the screen well, from this that. angle. Um, well, the go ahead. Yeah, the flowers are minute crystalline bells, one or two to a six-inch scape, hung on hair-like pedestals. Yeah, and I've realized now that I forgot to put the name of the plant there. Uh, the previous plant was Leucogum uh, vernum. This is Leucogium um, autumnalis blooming in the autumn, um, though nowadays it's in a new genus and it's something like ACIS, I think, A-C-I-S. But it's a little bulb we've grown and it blooms for an extended period of time. An uh, interesting thing about a lot of fall blooming bulbs when they have a spring blooming relatives is the fall blooming ones in many cases seem to have a long, long succession of bloom whereas um, the spring ones often just, you know, have one flush. Um, gardens in winter. I never did care for fair weather gardeners. They look out at the cold ground and leafless branches and exclaim, how beautiful this must be in spring. Mm -hmm. How many of you have heard that? Um, um, I, I, I really don't like cold weather, but I, I, I love the garden in winter better than any other season. And um, it's partly that the things that are blooming, and if you have time after this meeting to go through the arboretum, there's quite a bit in bloom. Um, you know, Prunus mumi and Mahonias and Camellias and a few small bulbs and stuff. And so this was the first book I came across that spoke of the garden in winter. And if you're new to gardening or new to the South and you came from a colder climate, realizing that we garden 12 months of year is a big um, eye-opener, and this is a great place to start. It, it, this is not my favorite of Elizabeth Lawrence's book. Um, it's less about her own garden and more about her um, correspondence with other gardeners and what's blooming in their garden through the winter months. And it d does um, give me the opportunity to mention that Elizabeth Lawrence had a huge and very active correspondence with many gardeners around the country. And that informed a, a, a lot of her knowledge about plants. Um, this is just a continuation of, of that first part. How beautiful it is now, I want to cry, as if a lavender wash were laid bulk on, well, on, uh, laid on the bowls of the pine, lavender wash laid on the bowls of the pine trees and the pale trunks of oriental magnolias, on the purple brick around the pool, the red earth, the amber gravel, and the fawn colored stone, drawing them all together in a series of related tones. Um, and again, this is Elizabeth's garden in Charlotte. And I think just that, that incredible use of language again, paints a picture 
that you don't necessarily have to see. Um, and that's, again, a gift and it's an inspirational thing, you know, that makes you really think about how plants relate to each other and the, the way as you move through the seasons. Light changes, she writes a lot about light um, and the effects of it on different parts of the garden at different parts of the year. The, the, this is the front of her house in Charlotte. Um, she designed the house. Her sister and husband were already living next door. Um, and they moved there from Raleigh in 1948. Yeah. Hamamelis mollis, the, the Chinese witch hazel, one of the virtues of this species is its long season, two months or more. It blooms when it is very young, but it blooms freely only when well established. The flowers are several in a cluster, four threads of translucent gold caught in a wine-colored cup. Um, and this plant was still alive up until a few ye years ago, but it's been replaced by a young plant of the same uh, species. Um. The Chinese say that the three friends of winter are the pine, the bamboo, and the flowering plum. The flowering plum is Primus mune. And um, Doug and I were talking about this, and Doug said that he felt that it was his visit to Elizabeth Lawrence's garden. JC's visit to JC's. Uh, what? You said Sorry. he. He. Yes, JC's visit to Elizabeth Garden and garden. Elizabeth Lawrence's garden. Um, and that photograph that you just saw of Hamamelis is one that he took when he first went there to meet her. And that he also saw the Prunus Mume blooming in his garden. And that encouraged his, his um, fascination and romance with Prunus Mumes. Um, a little aside, so many, if you're not familiar with the uh, few winter flowering plants that we're presenting today, most of them are delightfully fragrant. Um, Edith and I struggled with uh, the PowerPoint presentation, and I wasn't able to figure out the app where you had the option of having scratching <laughs> pictures. So you'll just have to imagine the fragrance. Um, um, about the Kymenanthus praecox, which she wrote about a great deal. She just observed that nearly every old garden has one in bloom at Christmas, and this is. Um, when she was living in Raleigh, so this was apparently quite a common plant um, in people's gardens at that time. And, and, again, um, wonderfully, and again, wonderfully fragrant. And, um, you know, again, it points out the fact that um, sometimes what seems new to us used to be common in, in years past, things come and go. I know in one of Durr's um, editions of Woody Plant Manual, he mentions that Edgeworthia once was a common plant. And, you know, so many things that J.C. brought to her attention seem so new and inch-working was one of them. Um, but I've never seen it in a, a, an old garden. You know, certainly things like a winter honeysuckle, which you plant and, you know, outlive the gardener and the house, um, you know, persists. But something like Edgeworthy, I'm not surprised, hasn't persisted. Of all winter flowers, the I Algerian iris, Iris and Wicularis is the most to be desired for delicacy of texture, color, and for fragrance. Um, and I think that, that just sums that plant up so beautifully in a very few words. Uh, Clematis serosa. Um, Clematis, Clematis serosa has now bloomed for me for nine winters, but I had to search for many years before I found it. I think we're in the same state right now. I'm ho hoping that Tony Event might propagate it again. It is a slender vine with small, shiny, prettily cut leaves and greenish, creamy flowers that bloom steadily from early October through February. This year, I even found a few in March. The vine is practically evergreen, but has a curious way of shedding its leaves in midsummer. When the leaves first turned brown and began to fall, I thought it was dead and I always pulled it out. I think probably quite a few of us would have uh, done the same thing had we not read Elizabeth Lawrence. 
It's, it's a hot. Mediterranean vine. It deals with a long, hot, dry summer by being dormant in the summer. So even though it's green through the winter, it is not an evergreen. That's right. And I was going to say that fortunately, I read Elizabeth Lawrence because I had um, brought this plant back from Christopher Lloyd's nursery in England and noticed that it had turned brown, but I don't get around to things very often. So fortunately, I did go in and I read Elizabeth Lawrence and went, oh, that's what it's doing. Good thing I didn't rip it out. So. <laughs> Um, in winter, the glitter of green leaves is like sunlight on water. I suppose it is the low angle of the sun and the quality of the light that brings out the beauty of evergreens. It's seeming from them to be summer all winter. She doesn't indicate who she's quoting at that point. Um, no, I, in some ways, I think Elizabeth Lawrence sort of gives us new eyes to look at what's in front of us, um, you know, to actually go out and appreciate some things like the sunlight uh, glittering off of evergreen foliage. Um, but the Bridger's broom is one of the most reliable shrubs for troublesome places. It will grow in the driest places, even under trees, and in all degrees of shade. It does need a good mulch of calendar in the fall. Um, this is the, the um, self pollinating, fruiting form um, that's quite short. And this is a plant that came to the Arboretum from Elizabeth Lawrence's garden um, that she gave to us when uh, Larry Hatch and M.K. Ram and I went to visit her in Charlotte. And when we went to the farmhouse fraternity, we found the, the larger form of Ruscus growing there um, as well. So certainly, a long-lived plant. Does anyone remember, you know, many, many decades ago, before plastic flowers existed and stuff, at Christmas time you would see dried branches of butcher's broom painted red or green or, or white? Yeah, no, no, I think everybody's shaking their head no, but in one of her columns that was reprinted in one of the books um, we're going to touch on today, she mentions just that. Maybe, I, w I grew up in northern New Jersey near New York City. She went to Barnard College, so maybe she only saw that when she was in the New York City area. Maybe it's local to that area. Hellebores viridis. All these years that I have been looking for Hellebores viridis and not finding it, it has been growing in North Carolina gardens and now has turned up in Wilson, North Carolina. Linda Lamb says it came into bloom January 25th and bloomed for more than a month. This is a photo of the plant in Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Charlotte, obviously, after she finally got a plant for her garden. Or am I wrong, Lindy? Did you get that from? No, uh, it was there. OK, thank you. Um, that was just one of those exciting things. And this is, as we were doing research for this book, I had never figured out how it had gotten into Elizabeth's garden. And I found her talking about it in one of the um, letters. Anyway, so I was very excited about that. And we were lucky um, in later years to know Jinxie Burnham, who had it for sale. Um, and would, you know, and so, so we were able to acquire more plants, um, Doug and I acquired some plants for a client of ours in, Char in Concord, um, planted them in her garden. It's a beautiful thing, but you don't see it very often in lists. Oh, and, um, this is the big um, window in her um, living room in, in Charlotte. And um, you notice there's bamboo planted out outside the window. Uh, Phyllostachys. It's Nigra, isn't it? With the black cane? No, it's not. No, it's, it's not. Well, just one of the, you know, Phyllostachys is the common um, small leaved bamboo. And you're probably thinking, what madness. But she had a very specific reason for doing it. Yeah, the idea of planting bamboo near the house came to me from her, Elsie Hassan. She had borrowed it from the Chinese poet Bo Jui, 
I won't lie near the wind aside, he said, to hear in their branches the sound of the autumn wind. All winter the green leaves rustle outside my window and the low winter sun sends slender shadows into the room. And I think that effect is magical. And in some of her other um, writings, she, she speaks of a, a cardinal that settled down in the bamboo every winter night and joined them for Oh, Evan says, what, what once he learned, he showed up one day when she and her mother were having elevenses um, by the fireplace, and once he knew that they were there at that time, he showed up regularly every day to be with them. And you've heard us um, mention Mr. Krippendorf a number of times already this morning, so, and maybe we've got a little bit of, um, ahead of us. But uh, Lobswood is a little book that Elizabeth Lawrence wrote for the Cincinnati Nature Center. Um, and what became the Cincinnati Nature Center was Carl Krippendorf and his wife's um, country place where they lived for um, 67 years. And um, this is what, there's a copy of this, which is one of the um, auction items this, um, this morning. And that's Carl Krippendorf and the house they built. And um, I don't remember. Um, yeah, well, when Elizabeth Lawrence wrote at the very beginning of this that his um, granddaughter had written an essay for school, and she said, my, my grandfather has... He's is a very a odd man. Yes, he's a very odd man. Um, this morning he got up and had uh, two prunes and a glass of water for breakfast, and then he went out to you know, work in the forest, as it were. Um, so he was clearly a person of enormous energy. And, um, and Elizabeth somewhere observes that where she grows things, you know, she has one or two of something, and when it's bulged, and Mr. Krippendorf has them by the thousands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was um, one plant, I, I read it recently, um, Viv Finkelstein gave me a copy, which saved me from having to dig for mine. Um, but there was one point, and I think it might have been for like Horace Grimidger, she, he said if I had only started dividing this 10 years ago, I could have had 80,000 of them by now. <laughs> Instead I only have, you know, 1,200 or something like that. Um, so I think we, we can actually make Krippendorf into a verb, you know, let's go out and Krippendorf those um, snowdrops that we haven't um, divided in, in forever. It's true. Um, yeah, I expect there are a number of Charlotte gardeners who never heard of Mr. Krippendorf who are growing the descendants of his Lenten roses. When I came here to live, he sent me a dozen seedlings that he had potted and grown on for a year or two. When they bloomed and seeded themselves, I passed the seedlings on to other gardeners and they in turn passed them on to their friends. And I think these spread, that this really was the source for <clears throat> lots of people in this country um, originally, because certainly I saw the descendants of Mr. Krippendorf's hellebores in Wheezy Smith's garden. In down Birmingham, in, Alabama. Yep. And um, so. Um, you know, you can either thank or blame Mr. Krippendorf. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think Elizabeth Lawrence, and I know um, Lindy Wilson, um, struggled with a huge excess of Lenten rose seedlings in, the, in Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Charlotte. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of breeding work, um, and sometimes I think, well, I'm not sure that offspring of that hybrid is an improvement on the parents, but I think that there is a lot of breeding work going on that produces really wonderful things, and I think Elizabeth Lawrence might really enjoy the modern hellebore hybrids, especially the ones that are sterile. Um, because it, it eliminates, you know, the um, problem of um, having too many seedlings. Though we can all practice birth control on them and cut the uh, seed pods off before the seed is shed. That's right. Well, I um, took a client of mine um, to Elizabeth Lawrence's garden, and she said to me, I wonder why there's so many hellebores here, and I only have one. Mm -hmm. And I said, because you're 
a really, really, really fine weeder. <laughs> she used to say to me that she had a ministry in weeding, and she did, and that's why she just had one hellebore, and we came back from Elizabeth's garden. She gave me a kitchen knife. She didn't look while I cut her hellebore into, you know, like five or six pieces and replanted them. And unfortunately, that led to a dynasty <laughs> of hellebores or uh, hybrids. Um, Gardening for Love was the third book she published. It's, it's about the market bulletins. Um, I don't, you know, market bulletins, I think there's a few that still exist, but um, it was something that the, I guess the USDA promoted. Um, it was a way of farm families to sell things uh, to other people. And um, very often it was the, uh, the uh, farm, farm wives, uh, that's mm -hmm. not a good term, um, who had... Well, Elizabeth Lawrence described most of her correspondence as the farm ladies. Yeah, and you know, they had things that they had an excess of, flowers and stuff from their garden, so it was a way for them to uh, sell those to other people around the country, you know, uh, wrap them up in some moist paper towel and take them down to the mailbox and, you know, ship them to somebody who sent 50 cents for, you know, a dozen daffodil bulbs or something like that. And um, I think um, her first book, A Southern Garden, is absolutely essential reading and um, very enjoyable reading. But if I could only read one of her books for pleasure, it would be this one. It is just so filled with the joy and love of, of gardening that it's an absolutely uh, delight to read. It is, and um, one of the things that was interesting to me is because she does she does talk about the farm ladies a lot, and she talks about them in some of her other books as well. But the last time I saw Elizabeth Lawrence, um, M. K. Ram and I went to Maryland to see her, and it was March, but early March, and we took absolutely everything that we could find in bloom. Took her bouquet, and we walked in, and she didn't remember us at all, but. She happily, you know, identified every plant in the bouquet. And then she started to tell us about these two lovely farm women who had come to visit her in Charlotte and how very nice they were. And when we left, MK said, I believe we might have been those two women. <laughs> and let me say, an honor to be included in her, her friends who were farm women. Um, there were several manu manuscripts she was writing on, writing, on, writing um, but, but hadn't yet completed by the time of her death in 1985. And one of them, well, and actually the previous book, um, The Market Bulletins, um, was largely was, written, is that correct? Well, she'd written lots and lots of it, but it was very disorganized and it was apparently a mammoth job put it together, but, but we know, well, from the book of her letters with Catherine White, that there was, you know, that she, that she was always at work, that that manuscript was, a, I think, a great love of hers, because she was very often reporting on work on that manuscript. And um, the second book she was um, working on, but hadn't gotten quite as far, was uh, the, a book on rock gardening in the South. Um, I read it, you know, it was published in 1990. I probably read it that year and haven't read it since, so nothing's, um, you know, nothing really sticks in my mind at this point about it. A, a large part of this book was written by Nancy Goodwin and Paul Jones and, 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 and some contributions from, I guess, I think Alan Lacey actually wrote the foreword to it. But, um, when she first started writing this, she actually was describing a rock garden that, that she put in here in Raleigh. Um, and I kind of had a vision of it in my head, and it was nothing like that. You know, it was a very formal thing. Um, but as we'll see sort of in the next slide, that she was at least, 
she was able to translate her love of rock gardening plants. And here you see the little rock garden plants being kind of overrun by larger herbaceous uh, perennials and annuals. But there were many, many treasures here in this garden that takes you down to, um, into the, the main alley of the garden. Um, lots of little treasures. And this was in her Charlotte. And this is the Charlotte garden. That's right. And this is just another. So you can actually see the path. This path goes out, it curves around, goes past the bamboo, and out to the garden gate. Um, after her death, a number of people gathered up her uh, previously pu published work, and uh, several books are the result. Um, Through the Garden Gate was edited by Bill Neal, um, also published in 1990. Um, it's a selection of her um, Charlotte Observer articles. Remember the day when <coughs> newspapers actually had a garden column? <laughs> um, um, and she wrote over 700 articles for the Charlotte Observer, so there's a lot that have not yet been reprinted. Um, I'll read that. Um, I found to my amazement that a weekly column is the most delightful way to write. You don't have to hold yourself down to any lengthy subject, like 11 market bulletins from 1920 on, but go into whatever interests you at the moment. Then I learned, then I learned so much by being asked so many things I didn't know and having to find out. And she further went on to say that also that the response time of, you know, you wrote the garden column and you went to church and a dozen people had questions for you. And she said that was very stimulating. Um, um, in, in that book, uh, Through the Garden Gate, I love this quote, if I could have only one crinum, Cecil Howdy's shell would be it. For it outflowers them all, putting up one scape after another from late May through August. Now, this is, this is a bulb actually rescued from um, the farmhouse fraternity. I found it growing out of the compost pile of leaves and <laughs> waving frantically to me. Um, and I, I, this, is, this was in my garden on Club Boulevard. And it is the crime that I love best um, myself, even though it is large. And she talked about planting it in, um, she had some sort of big herbaceous borders in the, sh in the Raleigh garden. And she talked about that she planted towards the back because its foliage was rather unwieldy. It is, it's kind of like having this wonderful green octopusy sort of thing in your garden. Um, but she planted it far back and it's tall, you know, about four feet tall in bloom. So that was sort of how she managed it. And, um, I, I, I agree with Elizabeth's sentiment about this particular cultivar. To see a single scape on one day, it's not that impressive, but it really do, has, I don't know, another crinum that blooms for such an extended period of time. And this is a small clump, so in time you'd have many, many scapes open at one time. And she wrote uh, A Southern Garden in um, 1942, so long before probably most Southern gardeners were aware of crinums, she was writing extensively about crinums and other members of the Amaryllis family. I think she, uh, Tony Avent's catalog was in the mailbox yesterday when I got home and I noticed there's all sorts of brand new uh, crinum hybrids. I think she'd be excited about them as well. Um, if I could say one, one thing that she wrote about a little bit, uh, she described one of the borders that she had in the Raleigh Garden as pink. And um, an interesting thing when we went at different times to the farmhouse fraternity is that you could find that bed outlined by the, the massive number, not of Crimean Cecil Howdy shell, but of the Lacoris squamigera. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, just huge <coughs> amounts of it still in those borders. And um, I the second item that's uh, in the auction today is a bulb of this same crinum, 
not only is it the same variety as Cecil Howdy Shell, but we might mention that Cecil Howdy Shell was another person very active um, with crinums and other amaryllids in the same time that uh, Elizabeth Lawrence was writing about. He was had, from California. He had, had a nursery, yeah. and his nursery list came with a heading, and it showed a hand shaking a shell so that you would know how to pronounce his name. Howdy shell. shell. <laughs> And the, um, the bulb we have is one that was in the ground here in the Arboretum. Tim dug it up Thursday, I guess, because he and I transplanted a large um, Japanese maple that was getting too big for its location. And it, it's now right outside the building up above the Cascade. Um, and those came from the farmhouse fraternity, which means it was from Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Raleigh. Um, I found the little sweet scented flowers of Crocus longiflorus. They continue to appear until the last of November. And that sentence continues right into this one. I found the little sweet scented flowers of Crocus longiflorus. Oh, I, I repeated that. I didn't realize that. Um, well, right. I found the little sweet scented flowers of Crocus longiflorus. Um, they continued to appear until the last of November when the pallid wraith Crocus ochralucus comes along. Selection from one of our Charlotte Observer articles. And this is, this is one where I always sort of took exception to that description, although she, um, I'm not sure that the pallid wraith is actually original because I think I found it elsewhere where she was quoting somebody else writing about it. But I always would go, Pearl drops, Elizabeth. They're little pearl drops <laughs> in the garden. Leaves outlined with silver stitching sound out, stand out as individuals. The scalloped circle of the ground ivy, the tree full of oxalis rosaliensis, and the heart, the fan, and uh, yeah, the heart, the fan, and the fleur de lis. And I rushed out this, just this past week. Um, and took that photograph because I love that description. And I was saying to Doug last night that, um, you know, it's, this, is, this is what it is to be in the South, that one day you can photograph that, and three days later you can find Heliotropum and Plexicoli in bloom um, in the garden. And a garden of one's own is not Elizabeth Lawrence's Charlotte Observer articles, but various articles written for um, any number of different uh, journals and magazines. It was edited by our very own Bobby Ward and Barbara Scott. And thank you for all the effort. I know how much effort went into producing this book, and it's wonderful to have those writings. I, th I think you really dug to find all of those, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, two gardeners, a friendship in letters. Um, th this is the letters of Catherine White, who wrote for um, The New Yorker, and she wrote a series of columns called Onward and Upward in the Garden, which were later turned into a book, Onward and Upward in the Garden. Um, and Elizabeth Lawrence, and I was interested because, you know, having the feelings that I have about the biography of Elizabeth Lawrence, it was interesting this because there's quite a bit of correspondence because Catherine White's going to send her letters somewhere to be preserved, and she convinces Elizabeth Lawrence that she should do that as well. Um, so I feel, you know, these are some things that they didn't mind revealing. And, um, one of the things that I loved in this book, and I did not read it thoroughly, but I did skim through, and there are all these things that you find out, because Catherine White asks Elizabeth Lawrence to tell her more about Mr. Krippendorf. <laughs> and so you learn Mr. Krippendorf's backstory. Um, I won't tell you, but <laughs> um, you know, you, you, um, that quote that we had about discovering how perfectly 
writing the garden column suited her life uh, comes from there because she said she was sad because um, when when they wanted to drop her her garden column for something that was you know more how how to do it you know how to articles um, but she discovered that that was the most wonderful way for her to write um, and, and there are lots more interesting little tidbits um, in this book. Oh, yeah, beautiful at all seasons for additional um, columns from the Charlotte Observer. You know, as I mentioned, there were 700 of them. So um, even between this book and um, or I always forget the title. Through, through the garden gate. Through the garden gate. Um, there. Are, a lot of choice points, and this was um, edited by Lindy Wilson and Anne Armstrong of Charlotte. And it's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, and it's a wonderful compilation of of um, garden columns. And I think you know Anne Armstrong lived fairly near um, this garden, and Lindy is the person who. Um, owned the garden for quite a number of years and really is responsible for preserving the Elizabeth Lawrence garden and she's with us today and we're really thrilled. Um, so this, this is also informed by their familiarity over time with Elizabeth's garden. So I think that they made their choices very carefully um, from um, the, these additional articles. And now um, we are where we're just going to give you some highlights of, of Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Charlotte. That's right. um, and this is a favorite shot of mine because it shows yeah. the ancient <coughs> cherry that was there. And if you can kind of imagine this house getting built somehow without killing the cherry, um, it, it's just an interesting thing. But and then it has the old daily pink. Rose climbing up into it, and that <coughs> rose bloomed on and off um, for most of the year. Um, uh, um, excuse me, I'm going to duck over here for a minute. Alyssa Florence wrote a thing that didn't really work its way in any good form into publication. I'm not sure it should have, but. Um, in 1945, she wrote this course on gardens for the South, and it was a course that your extension office could present um, and teach. And she has notes on teaching it and that sort of thing. Um, I think I can do it. Um, so this is this is in her first chapter is called Planning the Garden, and she talks about the importance of planning the garden. And she talks about, you know, that it's good to have a main axis from the garden that has a view from the house somehow. And this is the main axis in the Elizabeth Lawrence garden. And she talks about, um, you know, once you've figured that out, um, a proper ending must be considered, terminating in an adequate garden feature. And she says, this feature may be a seat, a summer house, a raft fountain, or any other ornament or building that's large enough and important enough, but not too large and important and for the size and the style of the garden. Um, and here we're, we're just on the other side of the circular pool, and we're going back into the woods, and the wall back there um, has this lovely plaque. Um, Madonna and child, and I think that nothing more perfect really could have ever been chosen for this space. Um, and I love this. This is this is turn left at the Madonna, and she built this had this little niche built, and the seat that's in there is the swing that was in the summer house in Raleigh something that she brought, in addition to some plants, 
something that she brought with her and incorporated into this garden. And it's a lovely little place to rest in the shade from your gardening chores. One of my, um, I think, one of the most special parts, in, in my opinion, about being able to visit the Elizabeth Lawrence Garden is to um, see where she worked. This is a window on the back of the house that looked out onto the garden, you know, part of the garden that we just saw in the previous couple of slides. And, um, you know, this is where she worked, this is where she observed the garden. And uh, a little bit out, 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 out of the picture are, were, are a bunch of file cabinets. She had probably thousands of little three by five file cards with her notes in an almost um, unreadable handwriting. <laughs> And, um, you know, I've, I've known <coughs> gardens to disappear very quickly after the owner of the garden is no longer involved. I had a little garden in my garden outside of Charlotte. It, the front yard was just 20 feet by 50 feet, but it was planted uh, to mostly winter farm things. And the same week of the closing on the house when I sold it, the new owner was out there with um, like you really need a piece of heavy equipment in a 20 by 50 garden, but he was out there with a with a miniature um, backhoe, and the garden quickly disappeared. And I've seen that happen many other times. So, um, Lindy Wilson wasn't the first owner of the garden in Charlotte after Elizabeth Barnes left it, but the first owner was there briefly. I think maybe 18 months, and was not at all involved with the garden at all. So it survived the first owner. But it could have easily disappeared with the next donor. But it's um, almost miraculous that Lindy Wilson became the next donor of it. And is you know she gardened there. Lindy is an incredible gardener. She has a beautiful new garden, and um, but she came to understand you know the huge burden she had in working in such a. Um, historic garden and she created her own garden within that space but was very kind to the the existing plants and the layout of the garden so it still exists thanks to Lindy Wilson. And then um, we have the Elizabeth Lawrence garden here. Yeah, um, we wanted when um, University of North Carolina Press wanted to um, reissue a 50th, a 50th anniversary edition of a Southern Garden, um, I talked to JC and he thought, and I thought too, that we should do a symposium in conjunction with that, you know, sort of a launch. Um, so Doug and I started to develop the Elizabeth Lawrence border. JC gave us a, a piece of earth and, um, and we had quite a few plants that Elizabeth had given us, and then Lindy was generous and gave us more things. Um, and we knew things that she wrote about, but also her spirit was very inquiring, so we added new things. Um, we did kind of work with the pink theme because of the, that pink border in the Raleigh Garden, um, but we put lots of things in, um, but we were mindful of things that she wrote about. Um, in this slide, you see over to your to my left, so your right, um, an old rosemary. Um, and this is one of the things that Barbara Scott mentioned because uh, Elizabeth Lawrence wrote that chief among her treasures was an old gnarled rosemary and she talked about you know, the interest in this season and that season and the flowers and the fragrance. And there we have one um, by the garden seat. Um, the red spider lilies, little chorus radiata that you see, came from Elizabeth Lawrence's garden in Raleigh. Um, there's polygonum cuspidatum, the Chinese bamboo that she writes about. That's from my grandmother's garden. It's a very young, so it's very short, and it hasn't taken over the earth yet. Um, but anyway, we begin to include those sorts of things in this garden. This is a combination. Um, the Indigopher for Coleii is not an Indigopher that she wrote about, but she wrote about other Indigophras, and that was one that um, came into our hands. And um, 
Doug's going to pronounce the iris for you. Well, I, I don't, I've never heard it pronounced, but I assume it's Sinchka. Um, yeah. You said that was from you. And, and that came from my grandmother's garden in Lowell. Um, so it's old, an old cultivar. Yeah. And um, I like older flowers, you know, irises and daylilies that still look like irises and aren't too scary looking. Um, and what, if you read a southern, a, I always want to say a southern garden, if you read a southern, no, I always want to say a southern living, but if you read a southern garden, um, she wrote, um, uh, well, it's titled Further Notes in the 1967 um, issue. And, and if you read the book from front to back, you're going to see it. But if you, if you want to find it, they never added that to the uh, index at the back of the book. So it took me a, a long time to figure that out. And I couldn't find the thing I was looking for. And what I wanted to write, I mean, what I wanted to read was what she wrote about um, uh, bearded iris. When we came, to, oh, I, I don't know, you're not hearing me. Um, I have to stand here so there's enough light. When we came to Charlotte, we left the old collection of bearded iris behind and planted new varieties in the new garden. I still think with regret of Princess Beatrix, Lord Lamborn, and the powder blue flowers of Souvenir de Lotitia Michaud. Lotitia Michaud is a thing to remember. I like the recent introductions less and less and do not feel that I can ever cherish such advanced varieties as Flaming Heart, a porcelain, and this is in quotes, a porcelain textured intense blend of pink, salmon, and tan, end of quote, or Flapperette, and again in quotes, a change of pace and a pleasant departure in melon pink with tangerine be beard. But before long, these two will be forgotten. And, you know, sometimes when hybridizers do all sorts of amazing things to common flowers like bearded iris or daylilies, they no longer, to my eye at least, at least look like things that sit comfortably amongst other flowers. And that's what she's writing about there. And, you know, one name that has stuck in my brain for many, many years, and it's now a fairly old iris, is one called Baboon Bottom. <laughs> now, we've probably all been to zoos and seen those fluorescent pink baboon bottoms, but I don't think I want an iris that would suggest that. <laughs> you know, and nowadays, modern bearded irises have these strange appendages called horns and spoons, and there's a third thing. They're called space-age irises. And, you know, yes, they represent some breeder's grand achievement, but they're not what I want to look at. I want to look at you know, irises that still look like iris. And I haven't found any reference to this particular cultivar, but it's very much of the, the sort of time frame that, of the iris that she liked. Um, it was introduced in 1918 by one of the first female uh, plant breeders in this country, Grace Sturdivant of Massachusetts. And I've lost the clicker. There it is. Okay. Um, this is another shot in the Elizabeth Lawrence border. Um, and, you know, there's one of the yellow vegetables that she wrote about. And this is a rare example of where my planting in groups of one and masses of two has been overlooked because the um, Euphorbia is quite an enthusiastic cedar, so this is this is a rare example of that, but sort of lines the path that we had in the Lawrence border at the time. Um, and I love this shot. Elizabeth Lawrence grew um, Aster tartaricus, and this is Aster, in the background. Yeah, and this is Aster tartaricus uh, gendai. And um, which is a, a cultivar that I think I we got from Alan Bush at Holbrook Farms, and um, it's shorter, so you know it has a little bit longer period of bloom. And 
Um, I just like this shot because I mean, there's the less Spadiza the less Spadiza that you see here in the background or foreground, whichever, um, is um, white fountain, which is a plant that looked at the Florence new and grew. And um, I would like to acknowledge here a special um, debt that we owe to um, Bobby Wilder, who was very kind in um, tracking down things that Elizabeth Lawrence grew and getting donations from various people so that we had garden, you know, plant, pass along plants from Elizabeth Lawrence um, to, to help us fill up this garden. Thank you. Um, yeah, gardens are so perishable, they live only in books and letters, but what has gone before is not lost. The future is the past entered by another door. And I think the most accessible door that I know of is the writing of Elizabeth Lawrence. So I highly commend that to you. Um, and when Doug and I were thinking about this talk, we know that it got late. We, we learned, I think, late on that it was Elizabeth Lawrence's influence on Southern gardens. But we think of it as why is Elizabeth Lawrence still relevant today? Do you want to say anything else? Um, well, you know, she remains an inspiration. Um, she, a lot of her writing exists as a reminder of things we need to try again, um, things I've forgotten and um, need to remember again. And, um, you know, and I always enjoy reading her writing. Um, She's, you know, if you read my little article for the Rock Garden Newsletter, um, she writes so well that I've been intimidated by her as far as writing myself, but her writing is also inspirational. So I hope a few people will go away today with a new interest in uh, Elizabeth Lawrence. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are most of these books still in print? Oh, the question was, are most of these books still in print? Um, yes. Bobby yeah, and they are. Troy are saying, yes, they are. Um, I, I shouldn't reveal my source. Um, probably other, many, many other county uh, libraries have a used book sale. And Durham has a huge one. And I often find copies of her book there. And um, you know, even on the first two days of the book sale at the Durham Library, um, they're really cheap. And on the third and final day, you can fill up a whole grocery bag for uh, seven dollars. Um, but if if you go to the used book sale at the Durham Library, you'll see me down there on my knees, look going through the garden. And I, I also bought four of Elizabeth's books that I own. Uh, that you're welcome to borrow. Just leave me your name and email address. They're up on the front table on the right. <coughs> and yes, Nancy. Just real quick, um, the plant sale buddy did it. Is there a center? Do you have any winter plants out there for sale? Or have you checked? Yeah. Um, the, here at the Arboretum, we have a little plant card out by the Bobby Wilder Visitor Center. And we try to keep it stocked year-round. This time of year, we're sort of limited because things need to be able to, uh, to tolerate being frozen solid on a cold <laughs> night. But there are um, two different willows, uh, at least as of Thursday when we restocked. Um, there's two uh, dwarf conifers, and you know, evergreens are so valuable in the winter garden. And there were um, Lycoris radiata, the red spider lily. Other questions? Yes. You mentioned this thing of so many winter plants being fragrant. Mm -hmm. Is that just a passing observation, or is there a concept about that and the possible why of it? Uh, did everyone hear the question? OK. Um, my guess, and I emphasize guess, is just that um, if you're blooming in the winter, you need to work extra hard to attract those bees. Um, and on a warm day, and you know, just above 40 or so, 
there will be lots of bees on the flowers out in the garden. Um, so I, I think that's why there's so many fragrant plants in the winter. So percentage-wise, they are there are more fragrant plants in the winter than there are in other seasons. Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I I I don't know, but um, well, winter honey. Well, winter jasmine. Even though it's a jasmine, it has no fragrance. Uh, you know, sometimes things have fragrances that the human nose don't smell. But winter honeysuckle, uh, flowering apricot, um, some of the a few camellia species are fragrant. Um, what's that? Edgeworthy is knock your socks off fragrant. Uh, Iris and Quicularis is fragrant. Some snowdrops and crocus are fragrant. Um, some, a few, um, yeah, Daphne, of course, yeah. Um, you know, a few hellebores are fragrant. One hellebore species is hellebores odorous. I know everybody pronounces Daphne odora, and we do adore Daphne O. Odora, but I, I pronounce it odora because it's referring to its odor. Um, you know, willows are blooming now, and I don't think they're fragrant. They're wind pollinated, I think. Um, but I don't know. Are there other questions? No, uh, the question was, should we protect the Daphne from the cold we're going to have um, Monday and Tuesday morning, which is going to be like 17, 19 degrees or so. That's perfectly normal winter temperature. The Daphne should be fine. Yeah. Yes, Dave. I'll just mention there's a copy of the Southern Garden for sale up in the perpetual used book sale in the visitor center unless someone's already bought it this morning. Yeah, oh, no stampede, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Bibbs. <clears throat> yes? Just another uh, uh, kind of facet that uh, uh, I think Lawrence is alive. I taught at Queens College when it was Queens College um, in Charlotte, and I took my botany students there every semester, and she never failed to be so gracious. She walked us through the garden, she told the stories, and she always said that when they moved in, or when they were choosing the, the lot, um, uh, there was nothing there. It was a, she called it, it was just a red field. And so she told Eddie, that was her husband, she told Eddie that it didn't matter what it looked like, just build a house with big windows, and she would fill them with flowers, <laughs> which is what she did. That's right. That's Elizabeth Clark's in yeah. Wayne yeah. Eddie was Clark. married to Eddie. That's right. That was the wrong. That, 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 but it was probably a red field when Elizabeth <laughs> Lawrence bought hers yeah. just down the street. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not familiar with the, the two gardens, Winghaven and Elizabeth Lawrence Garden in Charlotte, they're on the same street. Yeah. I don't know about three blocks apart or so. And um, one. One. It is, he says one. Oh, one well, then he would know, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you would. And it's, it's, I was involved, I was on an advisory committee when I lived in the um, Charlotte area uh, when um, Elizabeth Lawrence's garden was transitioning from uh, being owned by Lindy Wilson and becoming a, um, a public garden, I guess you would say. And because the two gardens, Wing Haven and Elizabeth Lawrence's garden, are just a, a block away from each other, it was thought that instead of having two separate nonprofits so nearby, that the Elizabeth Lawrence's garden would be under the wing of. I'm not making a pun here, <laughs> Winghaven, um, and so that's why if you if you do a search for the Elizabeth Lawrence Garden, Winghaven will come up. And if you don't know Winghaven, um, there was another Elizabeth, Elizabeth Clarkson, planted a garden um, largely to support um, our wild birds, and it's it's a very worthwhile garden to visit. Does everybody know that Whit Lindy is here and you can yeah. refer to Well, her yeah, but I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure that Lindy wants us to point a figure, oh, she, figure she at her. And, and, uh, there she is. She needs to be in the car. Well, yes. <laughs> um, I saw
saw another hand go up in the back. So yes. you can visit the Flutie's Gardens? Oh, absolutely. Do you need to make an appointment? or? You, um, you need to or look at their website and find out when they're open because they are not open every day of the week. It's not. It's open Wednesday through Saturday. Okay. Did you hear that? The garden is open Wednesday through Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you.